Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. Stan Osterman here from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies. And uh, it's been a busy year, all right. It's been a busy uh, week so far. Uh, I'd like to thank the folks from Hawaii Gas who dedicated or blessed their Honu'uli Uli uh, wastewater um, methane recovery system that went into action earlier this week. They had a great ceremony um, on Wednesday and they invited us to put our hydrogen generator, our 5,000 watt generator out there to provide all the power for the entertainment and the sound system and everything. And it was a great experience and really good food. Thanks for the invite, Hawaiian gas, Hawaii Gas. But anyway, today we're talking about energy storage. And you know, the more and more I do reading uh, on energy, the more the term energy storage keeps popping up. And it's because it's so critical as we start absorbing more and more renewable uh, resources as generation of power. Because when you can store it, you get back firm power, good base load power. But the kick, the trick is to store it properly and store it efficiently. Um, and a lot of times people think efficiency is just amount of energy in to amount of energy out. And that's all they look at and they say, well, batteries are really efficient. We'll just use batteries because we're used to it. And they're really efficient with energy out for whatever you put in. But there's a lot more to consider. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So my guest today, a little bit out of sync. He's usually here on the third Friday of every month, but we've got him on the second Friday. Ryan Wilbins from Burns and McDonald. Yes, Thanks for joining us, Ryan. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So we're talking about energy. You know, we talk about energy all the time and energy storage, but it's really more of a system. You know, people think you can just plug a battery in, but even even a regular car battery, a lead acid battery, you have deep cycle batteries, you have high cranking amp batteries, you even have different kinds of batteries. So let's talk a little bit about batteries and how they fill in that energy storage piece for the grid and for transportation. Yeah, for the grid, batteries have their role right now, and we see that it being expanded um, almost daily. Or, um, they, they've come a very long way in a very short amount of time uh, as far as the utility grid operates. When it, battery is a very generic term in the sense of explaining a chemical reaction that's happening um, somewhere else, somewhere not, not exactly uh, where we're used to operating on the grid. Mm -hmm. That chemistry can be made in, in a lot of different forms to, to supply very short-term, high-energy um, output or um, something more, I call it a little bit more of a power battery or maybe a more of an energy battery that we, we can change the, the chemistry that's going on in there so that you're, you're getting much deeper, longer um, release, something I want to really charge up and then bring back out. Then you start talking about, well, how much do I really need to use these batteries? I'm going to charge it all the way up and bring it all the way back down. That's when we start talking about the deep cycle technology. So um, if you're going to be using something on a regular basis, you start talking more of a deep cycle. If you're going to be having something more for like just an emergency, just in case, uh, just to give me just enough time until the power comes back on, then we start talking a little bit more you know, short term type mm -hmm. of, of chemistries. And when you when you make those calculations or you look at that at that um, choice, um, you, you have other things that fall into place. So, example, if you take a deep cycle battery and you just quick hit it all the time and never deep cycle it, what happens to the life? Yeah, you're going to shorten the lifespan of that of that uh, that battery. Um, they they are engineered particularly for very specific jobs. We don't have the the one magic bullet battery chemistry that's just going to give you everything. Um, lithium ions come out and it does a lot of things great, uh, but that doesn't mean it does everything uh, the best that it can do. So you start to see other technologies getting paired with batteries or even mm -hmm. batteries being paired with uh, different types of batteries. So, Yeah, so again, it's back to a systems thing. And mm -hmm. batteries aren't the only choice. Um, we talk flywheels, we talk capacitors, we talk, you know, other things that, that fill the gap. So. What are some of the things like a supercapacitor brings to the to the game um, of energy storage? Yeah, the capacitors are great at the very short term high energy discharge. Capacitors are used in in a lot of different senses right now. I mean, your phone's going to have a ton of capacitors just sitting on a very small scale. We can size these capacitors up um, to a very large scale, uh, utility type sizes. 
Where they were traditionally used before is a matter of providing a, a VAR correction. It's a, a power quality issue on the grid. That's what uh, capacitors were used for before. Uh, when we start saying supercapacity, that's when we start saying, hey, I want to use some of the power that's in that. It's a very short-term, high-energy discharge. Um, that short-term, that term short, is, is getting extended, um, but it's still short, uh, shorter than what we think of with a traditional battery. So what are the, the um, timing we look at for capacitors and supercapacitors? Seconds or milliseconds or microseconds? I mean, we can get into the seconds phase, absolutely, and and in the multiple seconds, I think there, the way you stack them up, we could get even longer than that. Mm -hmm. uh, if we want to start going more down the timeline, we can start getting ourselves into the more of the flywheel application, mm -hmm. where you know you want to start talking 10, 15, 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. We're probably not talking minutes with flywheels. Um, that starts to get a little bit tough because you you are moving a uh, piece of mass constantly, mm -hmm. so. Um, that takes energy just to keep something moving. Mm -hmm. And when we want to get outside of that, then batteries start to get into, uh, into the conversation of, you know, that's, that's kind of where we like to play. Sure. Okay, so on, on a continuum, at least what I'm familiar with, you have like capacitors and supercapacitors, which give you a lot of power really quickly mm -hmm. and for a short duration. Then maybe you move to flywheels and some batteries where you get, you know, a little slower reaction, but still get quite a bit of power and can handle the power surge yep. input and output. Then you get to a little bit, you know, more sophisticated batteries and, and even the flywheel extending out to maybe minutes of, of um, energy going into your system consistently, nice, nice steady power. Then you get into flow batteries at the at that farther end of that where now you're talking maybe hours mm -hmm. of putting power back in a, at a fairly good rate. And then outside of that, you start getting into your um, other means, what I look at as other means of storage, compressed gases, um, pumped hydro, mm -hmm. hydrogen, um, maybe methane or ammonia, you know, things like that that you could store a lot of hydrogen in and then put it back in a fuel cell and, and bring it back in, in terms of maybe hours to days to even weeks. Uh, and then also on the, on the power scale or, the, or excuse me, the energy scale, more up in the, um, megawatts, a uh, multi-megawatts and gigawatt scale. Yeah, you, you got it spot on. There's, there's a point when batteries are, are starting to struggle to meet this uh, multi-megawatt, uh, multi-gigawatt, um, and then let's not just, let's go from day, uh, let's go from hours and start talking days. Um, th it would take a lot of batteries. You can see it on something, a small device where you start stacking in double A's and it, it lasts you so long. If you wanted that to last four times longer, you're likely to be adding four times as much batteries. It starts mm -hmm. to take up a lot of space. Uh, these other fuels can pack a lot higher energy density, so the amount of space that the extra energy can be stored and sitting is much, much less. Mm -hmm. We can talk energy storage, everything from being renewable in the sense of hydrogen, but um, something that can also be relatable to think of is just the way diesel sits right now. That is. An energy storage exactly. medium. It's it's a matter of getting the conversion of the process to get the the electricity, the mm -hmm. power out of it. So a, a large tank right now that sits, uh, you, the the tank in the in your car is is a form of energy storage. Right. We just think of that as more of well, how many miles can I go? Right. And so battery operated cars that that's a conversion people can make. When we start talking massive scale, the way the grid operates. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not a, as easily of a formula of how many miles I'm driving. Um, it, is a, it is a scale of um, the number of, we, let's start talking gigawatts, or multi-megawatts, um, and hours and days. Mm -hmm. uh, that, then the equations start to really change, and the, and the amount of fuel and the mediums we're using, they, they're, they're vastly different than where we are on that shorter time scale. So, you know, when you start to talk about scale, um, one of the big factors that kicks in is um, when you get to larger scale, does it work or does it work better? Um, some things work great at only at scale. Like for example, when I talked to Dr. Kroc about hydro, um, uh, ocean thermal, mm -hmm. he says you can't do ocean thermal for a, a one megawatt system. You've you got to do like 10 or, or 50 or 100 megawatts to really make it worthwhile. You're going to have to put a big system out there to get your economies of scale. And so you have that same issue, especially now we're talking 
from a cell phone to a car to now the grid and getting up to maybe a gigawatt worth of energy storage that you might need. Now you have batteries at large scale. Are they still efficient at large scale? What kind of things are happening with batteries when you have them at the gigawatt scale and you're only using it to take up loads at the top end or just cycling that little bit? Yeah, the, the, it, the technology gets to a point where you have a scaling issue, absolutely. Um, just the way batteries were produced is a great example that batteries still weren't that financially viable until recent history. Um, subsidies certainly helped to that. But um, building massive um, battery factories where, you, where they start getting the economies of scale and start shaving prices off of just the manufacturing process. Mm -hmm. That's how batteries have done really well with getting into the market now. Now let's talk about using them at scale. When you get to the gigawatt hour type of application, there's very few gigawatt hour renewable energy, because a coal plant has multi-gigawatt right. hours sitting right outside. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm going to convert to just saying more of a, a renewable, ready, readable fuel. Uh, geothermal could be considered right. uh, that type, um, hydro. And um, let's talk hydrogen and, and start looking at these massive scales. A battery can store renewable energy, absolutely. But if you want to talk gigawatt, there's not a gigawatt hour stored in the world right now. That It is being produced. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the largest factories in the world are producing hundreds of gigawatt hours of batteries a year, but they're also going into things like cars or your right. phones or just being used for different things. It would take up an incredible amount of space in the infrastructure to be able to use a battery in the, the multi-gigawatt scale. And it, it would have a great use, but that's one gigawatt. Um, I want to start talking... Uh, five, ten gigawatt hours, um, even more than that when we start getting to like a hydro scale. Not something we can pull off here in, in Hawaii Boy, unless yeah. we start flooding a valley and building a dam, which would not, be not happening. <laughs> probably not any not time in our soon. Lifetime. <laughs> um, but we, we may have the need for that type of energy storage. We may have the need for that type of energy storage if we want to consider ourselves energy independent. Mm -hmm. We can always buy and import uh, renewable energy. That is a possibility and, and likely will happen in, in the next 25 years is that we will be importing renewable energy until we can make that final leap. If mm -hmm. we want to be energy independent, now we need to start talking massive scale energy storage of renewable assets. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not a very common topic right now. Yeah, you know, you're exactly right. I just saw an article this week that said down in Australia, they have a big wind farm that's putting in the largest battery that's ever been put in a grid system, and it's 100 megawatts. That's as big as they got. And, mm -hmm. and they say that's, that's the biggest one in the world right now. So like you, like you mentioned, you can make batteries at scale. We already figured out how to do that pretty efficiently. But employing them on the user side um, at scale is a whole other story. So um, we're going to take a quick break here and come back and, and talk more specific, maybe even get into Oahu's some um, requirements in a few minutes and, and talk about uh, what it would take to really meet our goal of 2045 being 100% renewable here in Hawaii. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that you know may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel, ThinkTech. ThinkTech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha.
Hey, thanks for joining us here with Stanley Energy Man on uh, another beautiful Aloha Friday in Paradise coming up on Christmas pretty soon to get all your shopping done. That's energy intensive right there, getting all your shopping done. Not only that, but mailing it, getting it out in the, in the mail. We have to mail everything out of here, except for our immediate family. Anyway, we're talking to Ryan Wilbins today about uh, energy storage and uh, how important that's going to be uh, on the grid, particularly as we start looking more and more towards um, renewable energy on the grid, because a lot of the renewable energy that, that's available, like solar and wind, it's only available when the wind's blowing or when the sun's out. So we have to capture what we can when we can, store it for when we have nighttime or low wind or you know times that those renewables aren't available. And we don't have in Hawaii a whole lot of hydroelectric. We do have some on the Big Island, probably some on Maui. Imagine you could do a tiny bit here on Oahu. Um, but we have limited numbers of renewable energy resources um, that give you good firm base load power. Um, again, with the exception of maybe a little bit of hydro and geothermal, of course. But geothermal comes with, um, you know, some cultural implications here in Hawaii. We don't, we don't like to, um, to uh, do things that disrespect Hawaii's culture and, um, and the beauty of the island. So even wind power here on Oahu, I mean, we can't be putting wind turbines up on every single mountain side that we have, or, or you know, it, it would just be disrespectful. And you'd have a lot of people just saying, we're not doing that. It's just, it's just not going to work. So energy storage is critical. And um, energy score, storage at grid scale is something that we just don't do right now because the grid doesn't need it. The grid right now takes you know, generation at one point and pushes it one direction towards the consumer. But now we're starting to get renewable energy out in the community in terms of solar and then wind farms and things that also push energy into the grid and, again, need the storage. So, you know, we're talking a little bit, Ryan, about um, the different kinds of st storage and getting up to scale. Um, what are some of the implications when you get to um, multi-megawatt scale? Like I said, in Australia, they're doing like 100 megawatts, and that's, that's the biggest, they say, that, that's been done in the world. But what's that compared to what we might need here on Oahu um, in 10 or 15 years? Sure. So yeah, 100 megawatts is that's big. That's uh, that's very large. When we talk gigawatt hours, which which we're going to talk in a little bit, that's 100 megawatts is only 0 0.1 of a of a gigawatt. So I mean, we're, we're 10 times larger. That is when I start talking uh, the gigawatt storage. So if you look at the renewable watch on the the utility website today, you can add up a little bit and I, I think I did a couple rough numbers and just said, hey, you know, it might be a good idea to, to have about 25 gigawatt hours of storage. Now this is to become energy independent, right? right? This is not a need. I, I don't want to confuse the difference between 100% uh, renewable and energy independency. So I, I do want to make sure I bring that up again when I mm -hmm. say these numbers because energy independence means, hey, let's produce all the power that we need to, to use, let's say within a day. Um, on the island. Uh, I don't want to be bringing it in from other countries or right. the mainland or something. Which is the whole goal. So if I make, <clears throat> if I look at the amount of load and, and add in a, a couple figures for, for a little bit of growth or maybe um, even a decrease in load, um, 25 gigawatt hours was enough to just about get us one day. Um, where we need to produce all the energy today so that tomorrow, if there's no sun or the wind comes down, mm -hmm. that, hey, we need to, to ride this through. Uh, maybe some of our other base load assets, if it's geothermal or something else, maybe they're down for maintenance. But one day of 100% storage, which you have now in diesel fuels, fuel. 25 gigawatt. That's, I mean, that's a very large number compared to the, the 100 mm -hmm. megawatt uh, megawatt hour battery that, that we were just talking about before. When you talk one gigawatt hour, just a small fraction of what we need, the, the amount of space needed to store a gigawatt hour is, is sizable. I mean, it, it takes a lot of uh, footprint for, for an island nation to start to dedicate. That's one. What I, some of the figures I haven't tossed on that make that number even larger are um, the transportation grid. Right. Right now, transportation is is um, not renewable. It's mostly carbon-based uh, combustion. So 
when we make that renewable, that is a that is an energy consumer that needs to to change to a renewable um, energy, right? So we need to become not an importer. We have to produce more for that for that energy being consumed. So the twenty five number that I'm talking about is is low. What also makes that number possibly low is uh, the the constant supply of fuel that's being imported right now. There's there's multiple ships already right. on their way. They're storage in the pipeline, basically. They're, they're essentially in the pipeline, so to yeah. speak. Um, they're on their way, which is important. So when uh, something like a hurricane starts coming by and we, we need to delay the next ship coming in, we can, we can ride it out a little bit, but soon we're going to need that to dock and offload the fuel so that we can start powering back up. Right. Uh, when those ships aren't there and we are an energy independent, we need to be ready for those ships. We need to be able to ready to call to import energy. We've got to be ready to pick up the phone and say, you know what, we didn't have enough. Send some energy to us, which would generally be renewable based so that we can plug mm -hmm. it into our machines, whatever we're using at the time. Um, that is a time factor. Mm -hmm. So if it takes five, let's say a week, it takes a week to, to pick up the phone and get that energy shipped to us. Now I'm at uh, not just 25 gigawatt hours for the day, I'm at times seven. Yeah. I'm, at, I'm, at a, I'm at a very large scale. Now those numbers start to get scary a little bit. Right. I'm, I'm talking 100 gigawatt hours. So I don't think we're in that, that area. You gotta, you gotta be really smart about how your, your generation mix mm -hmm. is made so that one, one factor doesn't knock out all of your generation. You can start. Right refueling our, our renewable assets. Being smart about where and how we're using our power is, mm -hmm. is the next step to, to minimizing that risk of not having power. Mm -hmm. Is it also good then to think of the future grid in terms of multiple microgrids versus one single big grid? Um, is, is there an advantage to that when it comes to storing energy? There, there's a really big advantage to that. So today, when I say 25 gigawatt hours, that's the that's the the load on the island right now. If everybody had the technological and financial ability to just have a solar plus battery on their house, that is actually a really good application. Um, the solar has a high return on investment. The battery has a great return on investment, and it's the battery is good right now for that application. Um, I want to store power today, use it at night. Mm -hmm. Store power today, use it at night. Well, if I have a cloudy day tomorrow, maybe I need to import just a little bit of energy. The calculations I'm talking about is no distributed energy, 25 gigawatt hours. Well, if everybody here bought their own 10 kW, uh, 10 kilowatt hour battery, that's, mm -hmm. that's a big difference. Yeah. You, know, you can take them, it's not really just a million, you take every household times 10 kWh, that's a big bite out of that, sure. that gigawatt. But, that battery is, is good for that scale today. Um, will hydrogen be able to replace that? I think so when, when the technology is developed more and we have mm -hmm. a, the, the two kind of mirroring each other and pushing each other's technologies more, mm -hmm. then, then it may be a hydrogen-based um, microgrid mm -hmm. on your house. Then expand it out to the community. Now the community is invested in their own generation and storage assets. That takes a bite out of the, the multi-gig, the multi gigawatt hour requirement. And we can keep everybody putting in their own assets as, as you go out. Your distributed generation, mm -hmm. you have distributed storage. It makes the the larger need much more palatable. It's, it's, it's a lot easier. But a place like the downtown where you have high rise, very, yeah, very dense high density popul population. They're they're the ones that, that aren't going to really just yeah. do their own. They're, that facility, that community will always be an energy importer. So it's up to the other communities or the, the overall utility to be providing that energy importing. But it doesn't need to be the, okay. the massive number that I'm talking about. Well, okay, when, when we do look at batteries though for scale, at large scale, now there's a big price factor that comes in. And right now people, when they look at like hydrogen for energy storage, they go, oh, hydrogen is too expensive. It's too expensive to make and store at scale. But that's because we don't have anything that scale to even produce a hydrogen scale. Mm -hmm. um, but when you when you start projecting forward and saying, okay, if, if we could, if we had geothermal to make hydrogen for the state and ship it within our own state rather than importing it, yeah, <clears throat> if we had that opportunity, and you could compare apples to apples with batteries for energy storage and hydrogen for energy storage, 
which ones in the long term, like over a 20 year period, you know, where you capitalize stuff and pay it off, what seems to be making more sense? I know you've kind of done crunch some numbers on that. Sure. I, when we start to scale it, um, it's absolutely in favor of hydrogen. I mean, by by ten plus fold. It, it's at that point, it's not even close at these larger, larger scales. When you get smaller, it, uh, the equations really start to hinge on the price of the fuel mm -hmm. a little bit, uh, as much as the price of the producing. I mean, you're taking it off of the grid and on the grid, so it's. A little bit different when you talk about the price of the fuel, but the price of the storage, uh, the hydrogen storage is pretty easy to, mm. to deal with, where there's no chemical process in a tank, and right. let's, let's just put it in a tank. So it's simpler, but then there's an infrastructure on you know how much uh, input output am I planning on. Mm -hmm. So there is a there is a place for each of the technologies, but as hydrogen as a fuel. Um, starts to scale. Its economy of scale will change the economy of that equation. It absolutely will. I mean, uh, keeping an eye on Japan would be my recommendation. Mm. Watching what they're doing is going to uh, change the economy of hydrogen uh, globally, um, just as that one nation. And I think we have, we share a lot of similarities um, between, I agree. with with them. So. What their decisions they make will, will change our renewable economy um, mm -hmm. just because of their scale. The amount that they're consuming and producing will, will have an effect on us. They may be able to find a way to purchase and consume so much hydrogen that the price drops. Uh, maybe it goes up because of the demand, but I would generally foresee uh, more production of hydrogen would um, also allow more distribution of mm -hmm. hydrogen, better storage, and uh, that, would, that would change it here as well. Yeah. Well, I just so happened to have seen a report this morning. I was just looking for some other files that my, I could bring to the show. And it was a study, not very old, it was 2016, where they looked at um, geothermal on Oahu, Maui, and the Big Island. Now, the Big Island's a no-brainer. Maui and Oahu kind of surprised me that we have geothermal potential on these islands. So... Um, I think maybe one of these shows, we need to sit down and look at geothermal potential for Oahu, where, the, where they are, how big we'd have to make it, safety issues and things like that, and start looking at it. Because I, I know that we can store hydrogen in, in tanks that, I mean, I have a friend in Phoenix that has hydrogen tanks from 1917, and they're still passing their hydro testing, and they're still using them. <laughs> you know, well, if your storage vessel can, can last 100-something years, you know, that, that's a pretty good uh, clue as to what's going to be cheaper, hydrogen or batteries. Mm -hmm. And um, so maybe if we can couple some geothermal on this island in Maui to take care of the loads on our islands um, with good base load power and the potential to build extra storage in, in hydrogen and keep a backup reserve for those five-day, seven-day, ten-day outages we may have for weather or storms or things like that. That, that might be the thing to do. So. Yeah, that's a great topic. I think I got a, a couple of seconds here. The the way that current nations are becoming renewable, 100% renewable, is they, they have a massive hydro plant. Mm -hmm. If they don't have a massive hydro plant, they have a massive geothermal capabilities. These two mass, big, uh, constant, um, we're talking multi-gigawatt hours in production of energy mm -hmm. uh, available to them. Uh, it's tougher for us. That's why, that's why it's a really technologically difficult um, to be able to pull off here, but it is possible. Um, tapping a source such as geothermal is, is, is very valuable. Well, let's look at that for next show. Okay. Let's see if we can talk about some local geothermal for the next show. Well, that's going to wrap it up for Stan Energy Man this week, and we thank you for joining us. And um, next month, we'll look forward to having Ryan here. We'll, we'll talk about some geothermal options here in the state of Hawaii and maybe the implications of what that could be for other communities I mean, they call it the ring of fire on the Pacific for a good reason. We have lots of geothermal all around the Pacific, and I think Ryan's suggestion of watching Japan will give us a good clue as to how it all pencils out uh, economically in the future. So thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week on Stan or G-Man. Thanks to Robert and Cindy here in the studio for making all the magic happen, and we'll see you later. Aloha.